Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, just really quickly, thanks all for coming to uh, our lunch panel on uh, Ben Buchanan's new book, The Hacker in the State, Cyber Attacks and uh, the New Normal of Geopolitics. Um, I'm sure that Ben would be very happy if you go check it out on Amazon. Um, but, uh, and, you know, you'll, you'll definitely learn a little bit about it today. Um, I'll, I'll pass it here in a second to uh, Trey to, um, you know, int introduce everybody and give us a little background. But uh, very quickly, um, in terms of Q&A, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this panel. Um, and the way that is going to be handled is there's a little button um, on the right, which allows you to raise your hand um, virtually. Um, and once your hand is raised and we get to the Q&A session, I will select individuals um, and actually enable your audio so that you can ask the panel um, your question uh, yourself. Um, feel free to also shoot us any questions over the chat. Um, in terms of technical issues or anything like that. Um, on that, I'll uh, pass it over to uh, Dr. Treher. All right, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ben Buchanan, the author of this book and current professor at Georgetown University. Um, we're gonna have a conversation about the book and the themes in it uh, with the assembled group. I'm gonna allow to introduce themselves quickly here to you in a moment. What I would say, uh, just as by way of introduction is that Ben has taken an interesting and I think largely valuable approach to the way that we talk about cybersecurity and that he has tried to deal with the real behaviors that we witness in the space and the operational and tactical details uh, that often get glossed over by some in the political science and research community. And this has been a tremendous asset uh, both to researchers but also to policymakers in thinking through these complex political and technical behaviors because it represents what we see in the environment as opposed to an idealized version of reality. Um, and so I think it's been a credit to him to do the hard work to figure out how to translate across communities and speak to different groups. And really, I think in some, in some cases, get some incredible details um, wedged out of these communities and into this conversation about policy in a way that's, that's been rather groundbreaking. So a credit to Ben uh, and the work that he's been doing on this. I'm going to kick to Ben, uh, excuse me, I'll kick to the group to introduce themselves, and we'll go to Ben to talk a little bit about the book. We'll have some conversation within the panel, and then as we'll outline, we'll have a chance to take questions from the group, so please have them ready, uh, and we'll feed them in before we uh, wrap up here at the hour. With that, if we could have the group introduce themselves in the same order as before, and then we'll go to Ben. So starting with Nina, then Thomas, then Winona, then Ben. Sorry, sorry. Nina Collars, the Naval War College, uh, the cyber professor uh, in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, currently doing work both on the military side of cyber as well as the um, aspects of the defender community or what's known as the white hat hacking community. Hi, I'm Thomas uh, Ridd. I'm a professor. Uh, have a book coming out soon called uh, Active Measures, A History of Disinformation. Um, I would just add to the, to the Amazon comment uh, that I think you may have a significant backlog because everything is on Amazon, not just books. So if you want your book faster or Ben's book faster, you may want to consider supporting an independent publisher. Winona, and then we'll go through Ben. Oh, sorry. Yeah, hi. <laughs> I'm Winona. Uh, I'm a security analyst at Google, uh, specifically Google's Threat Analysis Group, where we track nation state and persistent threats targeting Google Corporation and Google users. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Ben Buchanan. I'm a professor at uh, Georgetown University, and I'm uh, grateful uh, for the chance to be here with all of you. This is this is an excellent communities I tried to to speak to in this book the academic community uh, and then the the cybersecurity community that Winona is a member of people who actually are on every day and in writing this book I think what I wanted to do was as Trey said at the outset to find the cases that actually happen that so much of our discussion in academia and also sometimes in policy of cyber operations is theoretical or hypothetical right we imagine a cyber Pearl Harbor. We imagine a cyber 9-11. We imagine these events with massive destructions across uh, cityscapes. 
and I wanted to find the stories that actually happened. Uh, and I think what I what I came to realize in a couple of years of, of researching and then writing this book is that if you're finding the cases that actually happen, you quickly recognize that focusing on these hypotheticals of cities burning and planes crashing, you, you miss what matters most. And you've got you've to um, look at the events that occur. And there are some really great stories within. And there are, I think, lessons from that world um, of finding the, the cases that happened for academia and for policy. Uh, one of the biggest lessons, I think, was that so much of our discussion in academia uh, and articles that I've certainly contributed to, so I, I'm guilty of this as well, focuses on cyber operations as a tool of signaling, sort of taking these nuclear and conventional paradigms and porting them onto this new domain, thinking about ideas like deterrence and coercion and bargaining. And what I found in looking at actual cases, and this might be a good place to, to start our conversation, is that that really doesn't play out in practice too much. And that, in fact, I found cases in which cyber operations were far more commonly used as a tool of shaping, um, aggressively changing the international system in a way that benefits a particular state. And that these were a fundamentally different category of operation. If, if signaling is bluffing at the poker table or changing how the other side plays their hand, shaping is stacking the deck or stealing cards. And I found that A, those were great stories that a lot of times had been missed, and B, I think they tell us something more fundamental about the study uh, of these operations and how states use these capabilities in practice. So this is helpful, that in practice piece in particular. I'm curious, I, I think as we go into this and maybe rail uh, Nina and Thomason, we've had a lot of discussion about deterrence in the last you know, week and a half after the release of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission report, this notional framing of the entirety of Defend Forward and all of its subsidiary concepts as uh, acts of deterrence. As you're, as you're hearing Ben talk through this, I'm gonna sort of embed two questions. One, how do you guys agree or disagree that representative activity in the space is, is much more around shaping rather than signaling? And Ben, to come back to you, to the extent that you can talk about it, do you see that behavior varying between states or is it universal across the whole of the ecosystem? No, I'm happy to step in um, before Tom. If that's that's fine. Oh, so, this, uh, no, I think I think we're. Uh, so, I think um, I think a couple things first. Um, I think uh, it is not surprising to me that the Solarium Commission has decided to focus upon deterrence as a as a theme. Um, and I think I think that in many ways that reflects the policy orientation of the document. Meaning that it's it's been difficult to get. Uh, leadership to think about cyber or so the, just any particular aspect of malicious behavior on the internet as as anything other than a tool of statecraft and anything other than um, happening between states or somehow involving now and again a non-state actor who will then somehow act in the state's interest and so um, and so the the, the, the the huge landscape of attack and shaping and signaling and but by and large mostly just making a lot of money on the internet um, is the landscape of what we're looking at. And so in that sense, I think signaling is such a tiny, tiny, I mean, one within the scope of a military's cyber operations, which is already a tiny sliver. And then within that signaling is an even tinier sliver. Um, it's just not a terribly representative case. And so for that reason, it's exciting to watch a sort of Ben's contribution come forward as, look, we, we've got to broaden this conversation because the nature of the vulnerabilities out there and the way in which people are abusing those vulnerability isn't always about state signaling. In fact, it almost rarely ever is. If I could even I, jump in just from a corporate please. perspective. Um, when, you're, when we're talking about signaling versus shaping, the only um, large amount of activity that a corporation is going to see is the shaping side. Um, it's very easy to threaten a corporation on the internet. Um, and not follow through. And so those threats are going to be far more empty than the actual targeting and execution of a cyber attack against a corporate environment. I am um, often quite confused by the conversation about deterrence in this context. Um, and I understand it's a subject that has for historical and theoretical reasons, a lot of people interested in, in you know, making wild comparisons sometimes or more valuable comparisons. But in my mind, 
a lot of the operations that I think Ben is describing so eloquently in his book are a continuation of either simple collection, intelligence collection, or uh, call it covert action, if you like, or active measures to use a more you know, East, uh, Eastern term, East Cold War term. Uh, I, and these are operations that are designed to be deniable. I mean, name one major cyber attack that was actually claimed by the um, perpetrator itself, um, as opposed to attributed by a third or by another, by a victim or a third party. So the entire notion that we can easily uh, deter these, uh, or that it's even possible to deter uh, a cyber, this kind of collection or COVID, or, or COVID action, in my mind is misreading the phenomenon of what we're actually looking at. Um, maybe, I don't know if anybody wants to respond. Or, or, or even that it's a unified phenomenon, right? I mean, I think the, the over, that yeah. hyper narrowing to a single set of motives or a single set of tools that's useful from a state's perspective you know how to pull levers, but but um, but I'm not even certain this is a single phenomenon. I think I think that's right. And one of the the things that that I find most compelling when we study this is how many different things cyber operations can be used for, and how many different motives, even just in the state landscape. And you know, I know a lot of your work is is much much broader than just the state sponsored or a state conducted uh, landscape. But even just within the state landscape. There's so many different things that these tools can do, but signaling is not one of them. Um, Thomas talked about espionage. There's obviously many categories of espionage from fiber optic cable tapping to uh, what you might call strategic espionage, what the Chinese did against OPM, uh, and certainly very targeted espionage, particular, much more narrow and focused targets. Um, John Podesta the, of uh, the, the Clinton campaign, for example, as a, a Russian uh, target of, of focused espionage. And then you get you get covert action where there's a wide range of activities from from stuff like Stuxnet and Wiper to stuff that maybe is a little more overt, um, whether it's the the hack on Sands Casino or um, the Iranian attack on Saudi Aramco. And that is before we we get to the world that really is Thomas's specialty of of influence operations and active measures and um, how we interpret cases like the shadow brokers or, or election interference, which are much closer to what I call a destabilization, but but other names here. And I think the my my goal in organizing the book is each chapter is meant to illustrate a different kind of of uh, operation, but it's worth noting that that as Nina said, the the big takeaway from that is that hey, this isn't just one thing. This is a this is an area of operations in which states can achieve a lot of their different goals, except signaling, and except coercion. Let me ask and you about. Just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, and you even say in your book, Ben, um, that your or like any type of cyber attack especially one that has those active measures that has a more destructive impact you don't know what the extent of uh, or efficacy of that particular uh event will be i mean even not petya for example uh, had certain companies not been based in ukraine or had they had regular backups the damage would have been much much uh more contained than it was that's right. And I, I think Thomas shows uh, in, his, in his book and in his work that this is something that we see has great parallels in history, that um, these operations are unpredictable, especially when you talk about active measures and the like, unpredictable in their, effect, in their effects. And history is rife with people who have overrated uh, the importance of what they've done. And I think there, there definitely is some of that more generally, even beyond active measures in the world of cyber operations. Um, if I may jump in with a question to, to the entire panel um, and also Ben, obviously, and that is over the past few years, I think we've seen a rise in camouflaging yourself, a rise in, if you like, false flag operations, trying to look like somebody you're not. And I just wondered um, how you see that trend affecting the conversation about attribution, Our adversaries you know, moving a step ahead by becoming better at um, pretending to be somebody else? Or so what's happening there? What kind of dynamic are we seeing emerging here? We should start with Winona, who does this every day for a living. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. So Thomas, you make a really great point about attribution. Um, 
When it comes to uh, the defender side, so um, we like to call ourselves blue teamers, white hats, what, uh, whatnot, um, it makes our tracking and collaboration actually quite a bit harder. Um, so, sorry, dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the issue with using false flags or, or finding a campaign that actually has false flags is you can misattribute, which means that an already complex ecosystem of naming certain actors, like for example, a certain APT number can equate to a CrowdStrike um, Tiger group or Kalima group. Uh, if you misattribute a set of infrastructure to one separate APT that might not be the correct one, it makes investigations moving forward that much more difficult. If I may just jump in with a direct question to you, how, how much more crowded has the APT space become over the past, say, five years? <laughs> yeah, uh, so to give you guys a little bit of perspective, I think uh, in Ben's book, I remember there being uh, a stat, like 2013, there were you know, 13 APTs or something like that. Sorry, Ben, I, I was- There's a lot of footnotes, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, but it's 2020 now, and then in the last seven years, um, Google currently tracks 270 persistent threat groups over 50 countries. So it's less of a question of, you know, who the big actors are, or it's more of a question of who's not being seen in the space. I'm going to make this question when known hour, but, I, but I'm curious now. Um, so when when there is either linking of APTs or misattribution, um, like in real terms, how does that gum up the investigation process? Does that does it change what agencies you talk to? Do you talk to agencies? Does it change what corporations you're collaborating with? That sort of thing. Could um, you just briefly. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm not a policy person at Google. Uh, just to clarify, I am uh, on the more research and defender side. Um, but when we're talking about providing information and sharing information with our public and private sector partnerships, it does make it a little bit more um, difficult when one, uh, maybe FireEye comes to us and they say, hey, we think that this actor is, you know, X country and we think it's country Y. And if we have that disagreement, it makes it harder to collaborate just fundamentally. I, I think yeah, it's worth question. taking a, a yeah, step back it. here. Just, just one more comment on attribution, Trey. I think it's worth taking a step back here to think about how attribution as a concept has evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. I think if you had, had gone to someone in, in 2010 and asked about cyber attribution, they probably would have given you the consensus view, which is, hey, this is impossible. And this is a, a marked change from the Cold War in which if the United States saw a thousand ballistic missiles coming its way, it kind of knew where they were coming from. Everything is new and different in cyber operations. Attribution is impossible. There's no return address. And I think the, the debate started to shift uh, in 2013, 2014, 2015, the Sony case, some academic research. So that attribution is possible, and here's how we do it. And I think in, in some sense, the, the consensus has almost gone too far the other way about the, the certainty of attribution, that this can be done. And I do believe it can be done um, by, na by nations like the United States or, or by big companies by Google, but I think it's a lot harder um, than maybe the consensus thinks, and, and um, some of the some of the good work that's been done by Kaspersky, Ryan Bartholomew, Juan Gerardo Sade uh, have shown that uh, Costa and Rea have have shown that there's a lot more complexity um, to attribution false flags now than I think maybe the policy community or the academic community thinks, and that is that is an important difference. And certainly in writing a book like this, I had to make sure that I was getting the the perpetrator right in every single case that I identified someone and I, I don't think in some cases that it was necessarily easy to do and in fact in some cases it may way. actually be impossible sorry no it's a, and it's right. an absolutely and I think that's that's part of the point we're trying to grapple with um with respect to attribution and as you guys both have written about and in, in some fairly well-cited articles um I want to come back to this question uh, around signaling as a and collection Right, as these two primary activities. We've seen a shift in the last 18 months where US Cybercom has taken a more direct role and a somewhat more, un it's an unusual role for a state um, to be deliberately burning operations and trying to reveal information. Some of this has a signaling aspect with respect capabilities, but there also appears to be a significant operational value. Uh, and whether or not that has a, a specific deterrent effect is, is up for debate. I would come back to the group and, and Ben, I think to start with you in particular, 
how do these activities, you know, the, the work being done through Virus Total in particular, as an example, comport with what you're observing as patterns in the space? Is this something we expect to see more of? And where does this sit in the uh, signaling is less common, it's more about shaping, and a lot of this is extending from collections type framing? I, I think this is shaping through and through. And, and, and what you can see happening here is essentially Cyber Command is taking arrows out of the quivers of Iranians. And, and they're, they're taking tools that um, they've uncovered the Iranians using or other adversaries using, um, posting them to, to virus total, making sure the cyber secu security community, folks like Winona can defend against it. And this is in, in effect an attempt to denude um, the adversaries of their capability to act. So I think this is, this is a canonical case of um, Cyber Command trying to shape the, the geopolitical environment and the cyber operations environment uh, to its own ends. Can I redirect the Please. question to Winona and then say something after she responds? <laughs> Winona, I'm just curious, has, has any, have any of the Cybercom VT samples made any real life practical difference to you? Um, so every VT sample that gets uploaded to US Cyber, um, from the, the Cybercom uh, account, coming from a researcher perspective and not from a Google employee perspective, does get a lot of traction uh, in the cybersecurity community. And you do see quite a few um, analysis reports either being openly published or shared around the community as a result. So I would say that actually Cybercom has done a fabulous job uh, sharing with the community in this way. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to take a contrarian view to make this more interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, I agree that the, the, the sharing aspect within the community may be uh, worthwhile. That's, you know, they have a lot of Twitter followers and um, always get some good responses and reaction. And I'm sure uh, private reporting, TLP reporting as well. But can we point to a single example where they actually made an operational difference? I've, I'm hearing, you know, some skeptical voices there that the VT, Cybercom VT exercise, you know, is led out of the PR or the public affairs office for a reason that it's basically, that it looks better than it actually uh, works in practice. Um, I mean, they're counting our, they're counting their own Twitter followers. That's people like us, really, as part of their effect. Um, that makes me a little skeptical. So I, uh, I'm not going to speak as an authority on Cyber Command, but I, um, I do think that I think that part of what you're seeing with that VT contribution overall is, I think, partially a, a, sh a shift in the thinking of DOD more broadly. That um, I mean, because I think at the outset of cyber as weapon, as warfare, as a way to sort of uh, shape shape war itself is was the was the primary contribution that the UD was thinking through and I think that in those terms and actually because of its history is linked to NSA the the tradition of sharing is not one that was was uh, familiar to the DOD or NSA and I think that part of what we're seeing with that VT contribution is part of a first step in becoming more comfortable with information sharing overall and so while I respect that it's, you know, they, they would like to have more Twitter followers. I, I mean, I, don't we all? Um, I think that ultimately, I think the bigger signal that DOD is trying to make toward the rest of the private sector is we're trying to figure out how to do this uh, as a way to stabilize, not just the relationship, but stabilize the system overall. So maybe that's just me being too optimistic. And more generally, I do think there's a, a lesson here about exposure as a tactic. So I think it's probably fair to say we can debate the, the merits of individual samples that Cyber Command posts on VT. I've heard some of the same skeptical voices you heard, Thomas. But I do think if you look back at the landscape over the last couple of years, really since the shadow brokers, we've seen a lot of exposure of capabilities in a way that seems intended to render those capabilities inert. Um, we know, we know less about who's doing it in some cases than in the Cybercom case, but I think there's no doubt that this is a tactic that nations or maybe non-state actors are pursuing. Another great example um, are the series of, of leaks of Iranian tools that don't go to VirusTotal that, that appeared um, starting last spring, or certainly the group on Twitter 
intrusion truth that uh, for a number of months or maybe into a year now is just regularly burning uh, Chinese operations and, and Chinese tools. And I, I think it, it seems pretty clear that many of those uh, exposure operations, which don't have um, a face attached to them or not claimed by a particular actor, are meant to uh, hurt the, the adversary's hacking capabilities. And in those cases, I don't think there's any doubt that they are showing things that are new to the community. I mean, all I'm saying is, this is not a, we're not discussing a normative question here. This is not about making Cybercom look bad. I'm, the, what, I'm, what I'm essentially suggesting is this is an empirical question. If what they do is successful, then, I mean, we do have the samples uh, because they publish them by, de by definition, then we should be in a position to somehow come up with a methodology that measures the effect. How many times have we seen the, the samples deployed against which targets before release and how um, what's happening after release. I mean, for example, I'm sure there are more sophisticated things that one could do um, out there. But I mean, I haven't seen, have we seen that kind of research? Um, so I'm gonna push back a little bit on the um, kind of the metrics of before and after when it comes to burning tools, mainly because that's what a lot of defender reporting just ends up doing. Um, so especially when you're doing that short sort of uh, exposure uh, type burning of tools, um, whenever any sort of infrastructure gets published on some sort of reporting from a uh, cybersecurity defender perspective, especially if it's public, you do start getting that risk of first off, the attacker is going to end up burning that tool in that infrastructure just because it's been publicly announced. So regardless of um, protecting or you know, making signatures and protecting your corporate environment from um, the sample that's put on virus total, for example, it might simply be the exposure that causes the attacker to burn down their entire operation. Um, and then also from a um, previous metric perspective, um, because these are fairly targeted attacks, um, one sample is not going to be representative of the entire toolkit. So something that's going to be put on virus total to begin with might only be targeting a subset of whatever that operation was. So it's really just a game of whack-a-mole and I'm, I'm glad that Cybercom is taking part in it <laughs> in the way that they can. But how would you measure it for us? Pardon? <laughs> How, how would you measure effect? What's a, what's a better methodology? Um, I would say that it's less about the um, tool itself and more about the tactics, just from a, a security researcher perspective in general, um, just an understanding of what tactics are currently being used by many attackers and trying to shut those down as well as, as good as possible. So for example, Google, we see a lot of spam, a ton of spam. Every single um, attacker out there is trying to do some sort of credential phishing in some regard, um, or at least a, a large majority of them. And so if there is a way to shut down certain tactics that they're using to be able to you know, get past spam filters or get people to click open emails a little bit more, that's what we classify as success, um, rather than you know, this one tool set. Um, that's no longer being used, for example. Well, this is an interesting issue for us, and I think it speaks to Ben's point around the complexity behind how these decisions and targeting and tool selection are made, right? And it's difficult to observe a space where, right, when Nona's team may see 80% of the environment externally, we may see 10% of the environment and try to make significant causal claims and efficacy uh, based on those observations. Ben, I want to come back to you. We have a question from Rob Dewar as his hand raised, and then we'll go to Rick Harris. Uh, so we're going to open up Rob's line here momentarily. Rob, go ahead. Hi there, can you hear me? We can. Be. Rob, for those who haven't met him yet, is the <laughs> Director uh, of Cybersecurity Policy at uh, GCSP, our partner organization that runs the Geneva Cyber 912 competition. So he is uh, familiar, familiar with the pool. Hi there. Uh, yes. Good evening from uh, from Edinburgh. Actually, uh, we've, we've shifted around after the the various health issues that are going around. Um, yes. Uh, sorry, Robert, you're head of cybersecurity at the, G the Geneva Centre for Security Policy. Thanks very much for a very interesting conversation. Um, I, I'm reluctant to to draw the conversation back to uh, to to, to 
there are various points that were made earlier on in the in the discussion around attribution. Um, so the conversation obviously has has moved on to other things in that sense, but I think it's important to to make one particular point that. Uh, regarding the nature of attribution, which is something that in the discussion with the panel didn't come up, which is why I'm 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 keen to make it that there's actually that there's two kinds of attribution. There's a technical attribution which the Googles and the Kasperskys and the FireEyes of this world uh, do very well with certain caveats regarding uh, 100% accuracy and knowledge of a particular uh, of a particular actor being involved. But then there's also the political side of attribution. Attribution is an, an inherently political act. Uh, and it's a political decision if a, uh, a nation state seeks to attribute a particular incident to a particular actor, whether that entity or whether that actor is a state actor or a non-state actor. And the consequences of doing that are very, very different to the kind of technical attribution that uh, the forensic teams and forensic companies can do. Uh, I'd, I'd welcome comments from the, the panel on that differentiation, but also equally on, I, I personally believe that attribution is completely possible from a political perspective. You know, anybody can say this incident was perpetrated by this actor. Now, there are consequences if they're correct, there are consequences if they're incorrect, there are consequences of simply doing that attribution act that are very, very different from the technical kinds of attribution that uh, a lot of the technical organizations are getting involved with. Um, and that, like I say, I'm, I'm reluctant to draw the conversation back to something that we were talking about right at the start, but I think it's an important point to make because it wasn't really addressed by the, by the panel. The other point is, is something building on, on something that Ben mentioned about uh, missiles having return addresses. Deterrence has moved on or is moving differently now because in the Cold War, when uh, we had, uh, well, we still have weapons of mass destruction, but in the Cold War, it was enough to say we have WMDs for an act of deterrence to be effective. You didn't, know, you didn't need to know whether it was a cobalt bomb or a plutonium bomb or a uranium bomb to know that you had a nuclear weapon that was capable of great devastation. The problem I find that we have now with, with cyber operations is that if someone says we have cyber capabilities, everyone else just kind of shrugs their shoulders because we don't know what the capacity and capability of those, cap of those particular tools are unless they're deployed or unless the, the actor saying we have them decides to publicize exactly the kind of capabilities that they are and exactly what those tools could do. And very rarely does that happen. So d deterrence is, is changing as, as, an, uh, as a concept in and of itself. And so that the way that uh, we as, as, as researchers or academics or, or scholars studying the field and also the private sector that are working in this field, view deterrence, I think, needs to, needs to evolve just as the, the concept is, is evolving itself. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. So start I think... Ben and then open up for the... Oh, sorry, sorry go ahead. Yeah. No, Ben. All right, well, go I was going to... Just as by, no, by, way, of, ahead, by way of by way of yes and on the attribution as a political act question and and just to raise this to to people who already know this is the case security firms in the private sector and in particular um, information technology companies that are global are very reluctant to do the political component for very for very bottom line profit oriented access into countries reasons. And so in that sense, just to say yes and, um, that, that attribution of a country in particular um, or a particular um, threat group's nationality even is, is something that, that, um, that you'll see a strong division based on, on, on the firm and, or, or whether or not this is a, a national level message. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're going to be in agreement on, on both points here, Robert. Uh, certainly when Thomas and I wrote about attribution in 2014, uh, our tagline, borrowing from international relations scholarship, was attribution is what states make of it, that this is fundamentally a political process and not a technical process. Uh, I think that still holds true today. Indeed, you can point to cases where I'd argue we've seen political attribution without technical attribution. If you look at, for example, the, the White House's attribution of NAPETCHA, there's, there's almost no technical evidence provided. It just sort of is a political statement uh, that this was, in fact, Russia. Um, and on deterrence, I, I think, uh, in general, I would agree. I would just note that 
at a certain point, nations like the United States have um, shown enough offensive capabilities that I don't know that it's in doubt um, from other nations that, that the United States could use offensive cyber. I, I think the bigger question is, um, how can you deter things like covert action? How can you deter things like espionage? There's a point at which it's just not uh, credible. And, and that I think is a problem the United States has time and again in this arena. Um, I would just add sort of a, a different angle to this uh, point um, observation by giving you a bit of an anecdote. When I wrote my book on history of active measures, um, Obviously, at some point, active measures turn digital, as we've seen in 2016. But um, if we go further back in history, then we can actually study the full operational cycle of some high-profile operations, because we have all the documents from the archives. Um, for example, German or Czech uh, Stasi or Czech intelligence archives, Bulgarian also are absolutely amazing in that respect. So think about the kill chain. We have these seven steps going from reconnaissance to action on objectives. I think most people will be familiar here with the kill chain. The kill chain is only looking at digital exhaust of an operation, only at the digital footprints that you can actually see on a victim network or in the C2 infrastructure out there. Um, so, but in, what's really interesting is the real first step, that is having an idea for an operation. How do you have the first idea as an operator? Then how do you flesh out the first proposal? How do you pass it up the chain of command? How does it get authorized? How does it come back to you with a question to flesh out the proposal? How do you then push it to the next second phase? And then jumping through the end of, to the end of the kill chain, how do you then for example, pull in partner agencies. How do you communicate to the outside, to your own bosses, how successful your operation was? How do you assess success? All these answers we have, if we look at historical operations, we can really portray them in high definition. And as I was going through that exercise, it just became clear to me how limited our view is on current operations, because we see so little. We see only a small slice of the operation. That's an incredibly important point to underline. And I think as we as we talk through this, right, anybody who's seen the inside of one of these uh, threat intelligence shops, whether it's at a large organization like Google or a, a small vendor, it is remarkable how much of the iceberg sits below the surface. And trying to, to understand adversary behaviors and intentions as a result becomes a very tricky guessing game externally. I want to go to one other question Rick Harris submitted here. Uh, I'm going to read it out. Can the panel address Cybercom's defending forward strategy as a matter of shaping or signaling? Do the potential operations in defending forward reflect both aspects? Tacking on to that, um, and as an attack that contributed to uh, some of the theory behind defending forward, was the DPRK attack on Sony a signaling effort? And if so, did it fail in the attempt? So maybe, Ben, if you could talk through this shaping versus signaling with respect to US Cybercom, and then we can open up. Sure thing. So I, I think there's no doubt that the operation Cyber Command conducts under the defending forward or persistent engagement frameworks uh, reflect a recognition on Cyber Command's part of, of the, the preeminence of shaping in this arena. It's worth noting when I started writing this book, when I, when I started working on the thesis, they had not yet announced the change in strategy. I'm not saying they got from me, but it was a, it was a happy dovetail that they ended up in the same place uh, that I did. And what they're talking about is they're talking about this notion of agreed competition or um, essentially uh, choosing areas in which you will compete with an adversary not on an extraordinary basis in the in like nuclear war, but on a daily basis. This is part of, of um, functioning uh, in uh, cyber operations. And I think that fits very well within the shaping framework um, that I outlined. Now, the Sony case is particularly interesting. I, I agree that the Sony case, which is a chapter in the book, really is attempt uh, at coercion. And it's an attempt for one actor here, North Korea, to coerce a, a non-state actor, Sony, to not release a movie. And my argument is that there's a lot of reasons why this coercion should have worked. Um, for one thing, the movie meant a lot more to North Korea than it did to Sony. For another thing, they demonstrated clearly up front that they could do harm, a devastating attack on Sony's uh, computing infrastructure, by one estimate destroying 70% of their computing infrastructure. For another thing, they had what, what Thomas Schelling calls in his works on deterrence and coercion, the latent power to hurt. They could ramp up with the leak of emails, um, additional uh, pain on Sony to, to increase the coercive effect. They had the capacity to communicate directly with Sony. They did that throughout the fall of, of 2014. So they, had, they fulfilled basically four major criteria there for why you think signaling and coercion would work. 
And yet, even with this, even in the most ideal of circumstances, cyber coercion fails. And I think there's a lesson in that, in that even when the circumstances are right and you'd expect it, expect it to succeed, <coughs> it doesn't. And, and that I think probably signals something more generally about the limitation of coercion uh, using cyber tools. To follow up with a question, Ben, um, some of the stuff that I, or some of the opinions that I've heard on Sony uh, being a failed coercive measure was because the United States government came in and refused to let a foreign government interfere with an American corporation. So had that not occurred, do you think it would have been a successful, you know, chalk it up to, to the North Koreans? It's impossible to know the counterfactual. I think that President Obama's statement that Sony was making a mistake at his year-end news conference probably had something to do uh, with Sony's reversal, of course. But even before that, it's worth noting that Sony did not back down in the face of any cyber threat. When Sony initially pulled the interview, it was only after the threat of physical harm. If you remember back to the, the heady days of December 2014, um, the North Koreans posted a message saying, stay away from movie theaters, remember September 11th, if you live there, you should move. They threatened physical, maybe not terribly credibly, but they threatened physical harm. And that's when Sony and, and movie theaters backed down. Um, so even before the US government got involved, all of the cyber threats did not move the needle. It was the one not terribly credible physical threat that did. Thomas? This is a con one of my students this year um, who is uh, from uh, South Korea, uh, who focuses on North Korean operations, wrote a very provocative uh, paper in one of my classes in which he argued that the North Korean operation actually was successful as a deterrent. And he, uh, he looked at the um, movies that have um, at the trend line of in of portraying North Koreans as villains in movies, and apparently, uh, arguably, they succeeded in the sense that there are no m movies portraying North Korean villains since. So it's a um, obviously a difficult counterfactual argument to, to make as well. But um, I think we should be careful to dismiss the operation as unsuccessful. I, I um, just as a and as, as a as a question about the relationship of defending forward to signaling or shaping, Ben, I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to read the Cyber Solarium Commission's report, but it, I don't think it's clear even in that report what is meant by defending forward, whether it's intended to be signaling. I mean, I think it's clear in some of the language, the, uh, the language of imposing costs, that's, that's back in that's back in the language of shelling. That's back in coercion and 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 deterrence. So it's not clear to me that defending forward is naturally one thing or another. And I'm wondering what your read is on it. And and to be perfectly honest, like it's not even clear that right that Cyber Command knows what it means. To be clear, when when I made the comments that I did about defending forward, I am not citing the Solarium report, which I which is not a Cyber Command document. That is an outside group with their opinions. Uh, I'm citing the the Cyber Command strategy, their vision document that they published in 2018 and then again in 2019. Um, Paul Nakasoni, who's the, the director of Cyber Command and, and of the NSA, has, has echoed this in some of his interviews as well. Um, and I do think there, they, they talk about uh, causing adversaries to fear uh, the United States, but they also talk uh, quite, quite extensively about sort of throwing sand in the gears of adversary operations and denuding adversary capabilities. And, and otherwise interfering uh, with adversaries as they, as they try to uh, carry out their business against the United States, whether that's the, the midterm election in 2018 or elsewhere. Now, I, I take Thomas's point that we shouldn't take public facing statements as gospel. And there's a lot behind the scenes that, that we haven't disentangled. But I do think in, in the language that Cyber Command, as opposed to the Solarium Commission, in the language that Cyber Command uses, um, they they are pretty firmly in the in the shaping tradition. Let me ask a question, in because we we have one here from Sam Fisner, looking at considering the Sony incident as forward coercion, i.e., an exercise designed to ensure other countries <laughs> take into their calculus North Korea cyber capabilities and modulate their own actions accordingly. So come back to the group for a, for a quick tag on Ren. This this is a case of third party signaling as opposed to signaling to the United States. Love it or leave it. I, I will, uh, I'll push back on Thomas's here. I, I know Thomas uh, and, and his students think this might be more successful than it was. 
I would argue that, that somehow what essentially was a, you know, a doofus comedy movie that not many people would see under status quo circumstances turned into one of the best grossing movies of the year, turned into somehow a cause for freedom, you know, do your part for American freedom on speech, you know, rent it for nine ninety nine. Uh, widely distributed online. I, I think this is this is more um, example of the what in media studies you'd call the Streisand effect of shining a light on something you were trying to bury than the reverse. Now it may be the case that that since then fewer studios have decided they want to open up the North Korean uh, can of worms, and if so, that may be an effect of the operation. But it does seem the North Koreans intended to stop the interview, and instead they, they turned the interview into you know a cause celebre for for freedom of speech that's a reasonable point we'll have to see what uh what rogan at all cook up next on the freedom front uh, let me let me pivot slightly we have a question here and i, I kind of want to drive it at ben and winona um and i'm gonna, I'm gonna modulate this slightly so the question is regarding attacker tactics have you seen any cases of micro architectural attacks cash side channels specter meltdown etc by some groups and let me broaden that slightly in the work that you both are doing, do you see particular trends, interesting and, and notable trends with respect targeting particular parts of the stack or particular technology types by different groups? Um, so I will say, like kind of going back to the visibility uh, portion that you had, had mentioned, Trey, we're only going to see what we're being targeted for. <laughs> um, and with, you know, Gmail, G Drive, YouTube, which are kind of, you know, the big things that Google has under its umbrella, what we see is primarily, you know, phishing or some disinfo stuff, right? Um, although not nearly as much as Facebook and Twitter. So when we're talking about certain trends uh, hitting different parts of the stack, it's hard for us to say because, um, oh, and, and also, you know, Google Cloud. Thanks, Trey. Uh, <laughs> um, but when we're, when we're talking about particular exploits hitting parts of the stack, that's going to be more specific to the company that they're targeting. Um, so when we're trying to protect Google users, um, for us, we get a lot of the initial access portion, which for us seems to be mostly, you know, credential uh, phishing or pretending to be someone you're not in order to get certain pieces of information. Actually, um, we're publishing a blog on this later on, um, but a lot of trends that we've actually seen is people pretending to be uh, journalists and foreign policy experts. Uh, so trying to fish government employees or people who are in our particular circles uh, <laughs> who are actually uh, foreign intelligence agents conducting cyber espionage ops. So that's, that's something that's particularly interesting uh, from our front. Uh, when it comes to the stack, again, can't really speculate because that's not my area of expertise. And I can take the other side of this, which is to think about what nations do when they conduct some of their most advanced operations. And this has long been an area of fascination for me. And I think this is one of the least studied areas of nations cyber operations. So there are a couple of cases that suggest to me that there's a lot going on beneath the stack that doesn't get seen. Um, one case um, is a, a series of NSA documents that, that talk about um, operations against the BIOS, operations against um, UEFI operations that essentially exist below the operating system level. Um, these documents are suggestive of capabilities. These documents are seven or eight years old. Um, we don't know what the capabilities are now, but I think it's fair to say that um, this is not an area of research that intelligence agencies have stopped pursuing um, in the last seven or eight years. This is an incredibly powerful area of, of offensive capability. And then broadening the aperture slightly, one of the things I was fascinated by uh, and wrote a chapter on is the notion of cryptography supply chains and how, in particular, a case, uh, a very curious random number generator called Dual EC essentially turned into a, a, the site of a tug of war between what seems like two nations hackers, um, where they recognized that this was foundational for a great deal of cryptography that was built on top, and that by compromising this random number generator, they could get access to a lot of communications that would otherwise be secret. This was an operation that essentially on a cryptographic level was um, further down the stack, and yet it seems to have been uh, quite significant that at least one and probably two nations were involved in doing it. So the fact that that case, which is almost entirely out of uh, the view of scholarship and policy discussions, uh, pops into public view at least a little bit, I think is suggestive of how much else there might be that we can't quite see. Even just to That's bounce off of that, um, and 
maybe even to turn it on his head a little bit. When we're talking about policy issues or even like breaking bleeding edge research like messing with the BIOS uh, backdoor and encryption, that is at a very high technical level that a lot of average, you know, day to day people, even in the cybersecurity industry, aren't at that level. Um, and so when you're talking about the volume of attacks and the volume of abuse against, you know, company or even public sector um, firewalls or, or defenses, most of what you're going to get is going to be at a much lower level. No doubt. Even nation states. <laughs> Thomas, go for it. I feel Ben mentioned the shadow brokers earlier in the uh, conversation. And in fact, he opens his book, I think, with an anecdote of the shadow brokers and covers them in quite some detail. Shadow brokers being this mysterious leak uh, entity that revealed um, a significant number of uh, NSA uh, offensive hacking um, tools uh, over an extended period of time. And to this day, we don't know who was behind the operation. And, and in fact, it's one of the biggest, if the biggest uh, murder mystery of the InfoSec world, and it will continue to be that, uh, remain that. I feel, I feel any analysis of deterrence, especially in, if you talk about cyber command here, or the US intelligence community writ large, is incomplete without mentioning the shadow brokers. If the shadow brokers was a foreign intelligence operation, uh, and I don't think it actually was, but a lot of people think it was, then uh, it was one of the most embarrassing, successful, uh, and probably costly with a deterrent effect against the United States operations that we've ever seen in the States. It was just, it was, the level of embarrassment was bigger than that caused by Edward Snowden, I would, I would uh, uh, posit. So um, the larger point that I'm trying to make here is we cannot just look at aspirational statements that government agencies put out, we have to actually look at what's happening in practice and at the actual effects that it, that it has on the ground. Uh, otherwise, we are, I mean, it's just not, we're just not really serious. And this is a good trigger to, and, and to ask the group, I think we're going to wrap here in about five minutes, but if anybody else wants to pop a hand with questions, please, and we'll, we'll try to get them in. Um, ben, to you, and then, and then to the group to comment. As you went through this process, what would you say was most surprising in the difference in terms of access to information and quality of information that you saw relative to the first book? Is there a, a higher level of maturity generally in the, in the policy, especially communities that you were talking to? Was there a little bit more understanding of access needing to be granted to researchers that, that there was information flow here? Or was it just as just the same as when you went through and wrote the first, first book? I think there, there are two things that were striking to me in, in writing this book. Um, the first is the proliferation of private sector research. In writing my first book, which was more uh, theoretical and academic, it really was possible to read basically everything um, that was out there and every single report that came out from the private sector. And there wasn't so much such that every new piece that a private sector company unveiled added something that maybe didn't make it into the book, but certainly helped my own understanding. And now there's just so many people doing this and, and so many companies, big ones like Google, uh, and smaller ones that are publishing in this space that there, there has to be some kind of filtering at the front end. Otherwise, there'd be no capacity to, to actually go through all of the information. So that's the biggest um, methodological change. The, the second biggest change is um, where this book sits. And I think what's been, what's been most surprising to me is that my first book was more theoretical. It was quite squarely in a political science tradition. This one is less so. And I think I've been surprised by how many times um, I've gotten feedback saying, well, this is all good in practice, but what about the theory? And what, you know, where's the big data set that comes from this? Or, or where's the, the war game model, the formal methods model? Um, and I don't agree, I don't disagree with any of those methodological approaches to studying cyber operations. I think they all are incredibly important in analyzing this complicated, um, this complicated subject, but I do think um, the, the biggest surprise to me is how few people who are scholars like us actually spend time going deep, going deep on cases that happen and how good the stories are that we're missing and what they can tell us, I think, more generally about how nations use this as a tool of statecraft. Nina, Thomas, any, any thoughts on the methodological war being, uh, being waged here? 
<laughs> the methods. I'm not fighting a war. I'm I'm simply advocating for an expanding of the aperture. Well, I, I think I think that um, I mean I think that's interesting. I, I guess I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have called it expanding the aperture. I think that political science has done its own harm to its own self um, and it narrowing its aperture all by itself. And I think that there's plenty of good work, massive amounts of research has been, you no doubt have discovered um, being done everywhere, shared everywhere. And, and so I think, I think, honestly, I think it's political scientists are just a little behind, um, you know, hindered largely by the turn to, science, hard science is the only way to do method, um, but that's just my grad school barking in my ear. Um, I think the other things that have changed in, in this space since between your, the two books, if that's gonna be the scope of the conversation, um, between two ferns, um, is, is that the, the norms, the, so the, the growth of the security industry, certainly, but also just the evolution of, of of the defender community and the security community overall, right? The, they have developed mechanisms for sharing over the past years that have matured. There have been massive expansions in, in, in uh, disclosure uh, um, reporting. And, and so there's, there's just a lot more vehicles now um, that keep people selectively informed and, and um, and sort of thin out that that problem of the noise for signal problem. I think that that was early on that everything seemed like an attack. Everything was a problem, and I think that increasingly, just there's been a nice shaping of pathways of learning within the private sector and among the defender community that help everybody understand better what's going on. Well, I would just jump in and observe briefly that uh, I think we're looking at a right now at a historic shift uh, in which the since about six years or maybe 10 years ago difficult to put a starting point on it the intelligence community has lost its monopoly on intelligence collection and its monopoly on intelligence analysis and we see a quite busy marketplace today with a lot of companies doing work that previously was really just done by intelligence uh, personnel in secret and not of that not all of that work in fact the majority is not public and open, it's, it happens in companies, sometimes shared with their clients, sometimes share, shared with other companies that they will collaborate with. And uh, if you maintain trust relationships as a, as a researcher, as a scholar, with people in the private sector, uh, I think Ben has, uh, has shown in his book how that can look like in practice, then you will just be in, in a position to have more visibility into current trends than um, than you would have otherwise. And I think uh, we haven't really understood uh, or grappled with that trend, with that shift as a discipline. That's helpful. And I, I wanna take a second and thank uh, everybody for, for joining us for today, Thomas, Nina, Winona, and of course, Ben. Um, all of the second place teams uh, are gonna be receiving a starter library for cybersecurity and, and Ben's book is gonna headline the bunch. Um, so we look forward to seeing who is successful in vying for that prize. But um, thank you. A big round of applause for our panelists virtually. Um, and we are going to uh, move quickly back into sessions for the judges briefing starting right now. So thank you all and have a great day. Thank you so much. Good luck, thank everyone you. competing. Thank you.